story time with Mr. Beat. What's historical? I am Mr. Beat. The history of my home state of Kansas is not boring. In fact, it is epic, which is why this is going to be the most epic story time video I've ever made. It's also extra special because the words from this video came almost entirely from some of my 7th grade students. So in the words of some of my awesome 7th grade students, here is the story of the history of Kansas. Once upon a time, a group of people called Paleo Indians crossed a land bridge that was connected to Siberia and Alaska. The land bridge existed when there were much larger ice sheets covering the planet about 10,000 years ago. They followed the big game they hunted further and further south until they ended up in present day Kansas. Over the years, the population of Indians increased and the tribes diverged into groups of sedentary and nomadic tribes. They were nomadic to hunt animals. Nomadic is where people travel and follow things and don't settle in one place. Others were sedentary to grow crops. Sedentary is when people stay in one place to live permanently. Each tribe developed distinctive cultures. Hostilities between tribes were very rare in the early days. Tribes kept to themselves and didn't really know much about other tribes. However, as the population increased, tribes began to fight over resources and space. Not only was there conflict among them, but a new group came that would cause even more conflict. In the 1500s, Europeans began arriving in North America and claiming Indian land. The explorers were the first to arrive. They were incredibly greedy. The main motivations for coming to Kansas were to get rich, but also have their name go down in history and to expand their home country's empires. One such explorer was a Spanish dude named Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. In 1539, he led an expedition north from Mexico to present-day Kansas in search of a magical place called Quivira a city supposedly made of gold with fish the size of horses and goods made from the finest material. The Turk, an Indian slave, was their guide. Once his expedition arrived to Quivira, Coronado's dreams were crushed like a tin can under the weight of a steamroller. They found no city of gold and no riches at all, but the simple and modest villages of what would later be known as the Wichita, Wichita. tribe. Angry at coming so far but finding no riches, Coronado ordered the Turk strangled and his expedition went back to Mexico with nothing to show for their journey. The next explorers to check out present-day Kansas were American. 260 years later, Thomas Jefferson sent Meriwether Lewis and William Clark out west to explore the newly purchased Louisiana Purchase. Get it? Because you purchased it, so it's a Louisiana Purchase. Lewis and Clark's expedition camped at the mouth of the Missouri and Kansas rivers. Although they didn't like the water, they described it as a beautiful place with abundant resources. Three years later, another explorer, Zebulon Pike, also explored the land of present-day Kansas, but he didn't really think of Kansas the same way Lewis and Clark did. He noted the land was nothing more than a desert with sandy hills and dry air. In 1829, another explorer named Stephen Long came to the same conclusion as Pike. In fact, Long is credited with being the first one to label much of Kansas and the Great Plains as the Great American Desert. This caused the U.S. government to believe that the land was useless. So that was where they began to force all the Native Americans who were still back east. For many decades, Americans traveled through Kansas, but rarely stopped there. As more pioneers moved west, trails began to form. Two of these trails were the Oregon Trail and the Santa Fe Trail. The Oregon Trail was used to transport people to the fertile lands in the west, while the Santa Fe Trail was mostly used as a trade route. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 opened Kansas for settlement and allowed the new settlers to determine whether it would be admitted as a slave state or a free state. Naturally, this caused a mad rush of pro-slavery and anti-slavery advocates to Kansas, and violence would often occur between the two groups. That's where the territory earned the nickname Bleeding Kansas. The pro-slavery advocates formed a group called Bushwhackers that would go in and attack anti-slavery advocates. And the anti-slavery advocates formed their own group called the Jayhawkers that would attack the Bushwhackers. John Brown was probably the most famous, or infamous, Jayhawker of them all. 
On the early morning of May 25th, 1856, Brown and his sons killed five pro-slavery advocates during the Pottawatomie Massacre. He also defended the town of Osawatomie when the pro-slavery groups attacked. All in all, he was a hero to anti-slavery groups and a terrorist to the pro-slavery groups. With all of the violence, many argued that the American Civil War really began in Kansas in the 1850s. The Free Staters would triumph, though. Shortly before the Civil War broke out, on January 29, 1861, Kansas was admitted to the Union as a free state. During the Civil War, Kansas was not immune to more violence. A Confederate military leader named William Quantrill was very mad at the Jayhawkers for burning down the bushwhacker city of Osceola, Missouri. On August 21st, 1863, Quantrill and a band of 300 men went to Lawrence, killing every man and boy in sight. They burned down the city and destroyed everything in their path. After the four years of war, Kansas went back to developing. At the time, few people actually lived in Kansas, but that was about to change. During the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln had signed the Homestead Act to encourage settlement to less desirable land, much of that being in Kansas. The law stated that any new settler who came to Kansas could get up to 160 acres of free land as long as they lived on and improved that land for at least five years. Pretty good deal. These people who got the land grants were called homesteaders. Life was difficult for the homesteaders who moved out to Kansas, but they adapted. Because there weren't many trees, people had to make houses out of mud and keep warm in the winter by burning dried buffalo poop. To deal with droughts, they drilled deep wells to irrigate their crops. They made fences by inventing barbed wire. To cook their food, they burned hay and tall grass. Life was hard on the Kansas frontier, but more and more people came. Immigrants from all over the world came to live in Kansas, but the Germans were by far the largest immigrant group. Many former slaves moved to Kansas to escape the discrimination in the South. To them, Kansas represented the, quote, promised land. One group of African Americans who later came were known as the Exodusters. Around 25,000 Exodusters came to live in Kansas between 1879 and 1881. Life in Kansas was difficult for them because they were usually poor and they were often not welcomed in any already established cities due to the racism and overcrowdedness. Most of them ended up starting communities of their own. While most immigrants who came to Kansas became wheat farmers, a growing number of workers thrived in the cattle industry. Back then, meat had to be eaten fresh and food had to be transported quickly before it spoiled. Thus, the cattle drives were born. Now, I know that little kids always want to be a cowgirl or cowboy, but their image of them is usually wrong. A real cowboy wasn't always what the movies made them out to be. Cowboys had the job of leading cattle to the railroads so that they could then move them. Because there were few railroads in the South, cowboys would travel to Texas and lead sometimes as many as 3,000 cattle at once north to different cow towns. In order for a town to become a thriving cow town, it would have to be by a railroad so the beef could travel east quickly. Unfortunately, the Kansas legislature ended the cattle drives because the cows were dying from a disease called Texas fever. Also, more and more railroads were being built in the South, so the cattle drives really weren't needed anymore. The railroads had a dramatic impact on the development of Kansas. Railroad, railroad grants were free land given to the railroad companies so they could build railroads and sell off the land where settlers came to settle nearby. However, many people didn't like these deals because they thought the railroad industry was getting too sweet of a deal and was ripping off settlers. One-sixth of Kansas land was eventually given to railroad companies. Reaction to this monopoly which is when one company dominates a whole market, by railroad companies helped cause the first of many of the reform movements in Kansas. In fact, a new political party, the People's Party, was created, and tens of thousands in Kansas joined. They wanted to do things like break up monopolies so that prices were subject to competition, limit government revenue so it didn't exceed government spending, create an income tax where rich people pay a higher percent of their earnings than poor people, and give the government ownership of railroads, telephones, and telegraphs. Many who joined the People's Party were wheat farmers. A popular saying back then was, the rain, the rain follows, follows the plow. plow. What the heck does that mean? 
Well, many Kansas farmers actually believed they could make it rain on the land where they farmed. Were they right? Oh, heck no. In the late 1880s and early 1890s, Kansas farmers faced difficult times when droughts caused massive crop failures, and many of them lost their farms due to not being able to pay off debts. This just made the populist movement, as it was called, grow. Not everyone was doing poorly during this time. After oil and gas was discovered in Kansas, many moved there to make a fortune. There was an oil boom, and the economy of Kansas grew because of the growing demand for oil, especially when people began using gasoline-powered automobiles. That's also known as a car, by the way, for you young folk. At the beginning of the 1900s, new reform movements began. Kansas deserves to be a better state, the progressives cried. They wanted to make election, labor, economic, business, and education reforms so that Kansas would become a state people would be proud of and have equality. Speaking of equality, women push for equal rights. On November 5, 1912, Kansas voters approved the Equal Suffrage Amendment to the state constitution, giving women the right to vote almost eight years before the United States Constitution allowed them to. When World War I broke out in Europe, Kansas played a huge role. Kansas crops became extremely valuable because European countries couldn't grow their own. After the United States entered the war, Kansas only provided crops for the Allied powers. Many said, win the war with wheat, because the more crops soldiers had led to a higher chance of them winning. About 80,000 Kansans enlisted in the military for World War I. After the war ended, most of the country's economy thrived during the 1920s. But not for Kansas farmers. They were losing money. Things got worse in the 1930s during the Great Depression. A huge economic downturn for the entire country and the world in a time of poverty and sadness. It caused farmers to lose money because people everywhere weren't buying as much food. But another problem devastated Kansas during that time. The Dust Bowl was the time period where there was little rain, hot days, and high soil erosion. There was nothing holding the soil down, so the wind swept it up and it created horrifying dust storms. I'm not talking about tiny little dust particles blowing around. I'm talking about giant thick clouds of dust that covered entire cities. Many farms were devastated and many Kansans fled the state. The farmers who stayed learned to create ways, such as contour farming and planting millions of trees, to hold the soil on the ground to keep it from eroding and blowing away. In 1941, the United States found itself in the middle of World War II. Again, tens of thousands of Kansans volunteered to fight the Axis powers. The U.S. Army Air Forces needed a place for training ranges, and Kansas was preferential because it had good year-round flying conditions. The thinly populated land made ideal locations for practicing war exercises. Airmen training at Kansas airfields were provided with the skills that enabled them to go into combat and eventually defeat Nazi Germany in Imperial Japan. After that war, the country was forced to confront another issue, segregation by race. 100 years after slavery was abolished, African Americans were still treated like second-class citizens. Segregation in Kansas schools had existed since 1879, but in 1954, the capital city of Topeka became a hot spot for the civil rights movement. A few African American parents teamed up to enroll their children into an all-white school. They were rejected. So the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, yes, they still exist today, argue the case to the Supreme Court saying that blacks did not have the same educational opportunities as whites. They won the case, ultimately causing all schools in the United States to become integrated. That case's name, by the way, was Brown, Brown v. v. the Topeka, Topeka Board, Board of, of Education, Education, a pretty famous one. Throughout much of the 20th century, the United States was caught in the middle of what became known as the Cold War with the Soviet Union. During this tense time between the two countries, Fort Riley and Fort Leavenworth became training centers for soldiers going overseas as the United States fought numerous wars and conflicts in the name of defeating communism during this time. Another trend in Kansas in more recent times has been its rural depopulation. More and more people are leaving the country and moving to cities. The main reason for this migration is because less people are needed to work on farms due to increasing technology. This continues to the present time, and many small towns in Kansas are losing so many people that the government has offered tax breaks and free land to get people to move there. Today, Kansas is not known as a, quote, progressive state, 
But when Joan Finney became governor of Kansas in 1991, she was only the 11th female governor in American history up to that point. In fact, Kansas as a whole is much more complicated than people make it out to be. It is no longer strictly a farming state, and now mostly makes all its money from manufacturing and in the service industry. Its fastest growing immigrant group is Hispanics. It's now known more for basketball than it is for wheat. Its largest and fastest growing county is almost in Missouri. And it's not a state of farmers. Nearly three out of four Kansans today live in a city or town, not in the country. While its history as a state was chaotic and full of conflict and violence early on, it has been a peaceful and happy place to live and work ever since. The end.